So I want to welcome you to the Nuclear Policy Working Group's third annual expert panel discussion on nuclear science and security policy. I'm Bethany Goldblum, the director of the Nuclear Policy Working Group. Our group operates under the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium, a UC Berkeley-led effort um, established by an award made by the National Nuclear Security Administration. The consortium is composed of seven academic institutions and four national laboratories working collectively to train the next generation of nuclear security experts. I'd like to recognize the leadership of the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium, Professor Vujic, um, the, the principal investigator of the award and the director of the NSSC. So the Nuclear Policy Working Group, uh-oh, is an organization on campus composed of undergraduate students, graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, and national laboratory scientists. And we're focused on examining contemporary issues in nuclear security policy from an interdisciplinary perspective. I'd like to thank the group for their efforts um, to organize this event, and I would particularly like to recognize the efforts of Erica Suzuki, um, the deputy director of the Nuclear Policy Working Group. The group meets on a bi-weekly basis here on the UC Berkeley campus with satellite chapters at UC Irvine, UC Davis, and Michigan State University. So if you're excited and interested in what you hear tonight, and I hope that you are, then I encourage you to get in touch with us and join our efforts. You can learn more about our group um, on our website, npwg.berkeley.edu. So tonight's discussion focuses on the power of the public for nonproliferation. We'll begin by posing a series of questions to the panelists, but you in the audience will also have the opportunity for your voice to be heard. As you entered the auditorium this evening, hopefully you received note cards and a pen. If you did not receive this, raise your hand now and the ushers will move through the aisles and provide this to you. So mid-event, we're going to collect these questions and then we'll provide them to our moderator for further discussion. For those of you joining us in cyberspace or at one of our viewing parties, you can use the form on our website or you can submit your questions by tweeting them to us at UCB underscore NPWG using the hashtag open source. So tonight we're going to explore the role of the public and open source information in nuclear security and arms control. Sensing capabilities have led to major shifts in international agreements about the control of nuclear weapons. In the late 50s, the maturation of seismographic triangulation led to the Underground Test Ban Treaty. The Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty of the early 70s was introduced as satellite um, imagery gained resolution. And tonight we're going to discuss new capabilities in the form of informational sensing that have set the stage for another major change in arms control verification and by proxy nuclear nonproliferation. So to learn more about how social media, ubiquitous sensing, and satellite imagery may be used to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons, we've gathered a group of experts with an expansive collective skill set. So from the left, our panelists include um, James Cornell, a research engineer at the National Security Technologies Special Technologies Laboratory. Cornell is an expert in computational ontologies, systems development, artificial intelligence, and cognitive psychology. Brian Lee, the interim deputy director of the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. Lee is a former career Army officer and served as the Director of International Counterproliferation Program at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Prior to this, Brian was a Senior Intelligence Officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency, where he led the teams responsible for Russian and Central Asian military affairs. Maynard Holliday, a Presidential <coughs> Appointed Special Assistant to the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics at the Pentagon, He's worked as a senior engineering and robotics professional in government and the private sector for the last 25 plus years. He's a former project engineer and program manager at Lawrence Livermore and Sandia National Laboratories. And Frank Pabian, a senior geospatial information analyst and fellow at Los Alamos National Laboratory. 
Habian has 40 years of experience as a satellite imagery analyst and nuclear nonproliferation expert, including serving as the nuclear chief inspector in Iraq for the International Atomic Energy Agency. The event will be moderated by Zoe Gastelum, a senior member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories in the Global Technology Engagement Research and Analysis Department in the Center for Nonproliferation and Cooperative Threat Reduction. Her research focuses on the development of computational models and analytical tools to support nonproliferation, including conceptual development of mobile platforms for international safeguards inspections, evaluation of open source information for nonproliferation verification applications, and the use of advanced analytics to support information fusion in diverse data environments. And with that, I will turn the event over to Zoe. Thank you. Um, so in the past 15 to 20 years, I think we've really seen an expansion of uh, technologies to access the internet and also the information that's available uh, via the internet. And that growth has led to an investigation by the broader nonproliferation community to look into how might some of those information sources be used to support their verification efforts. Um, some organizations like the IEA already use um, open source information to some extent, uh, websites and uh, satellite images to support their verification, but uh, the breadth of the information sources and the technologies that are currently available and now <coughs> emerging are, are much uh, for, uh, broader than that. And you know, traditionally we've seen some tension between the traditional verification uh, measures from the nonproliferation community and, um, and some of these emerging open source technologies. So to have a conversation about these open source technologies, we must really broaden the scope beyond just talking about Twitter or Facebook to think about uh, really the full amount of information that's available um, openly and, and the technologies that are associated with that. And just one example is you know, that my Fitbit slaps my, uh, tracks my sleep and I can share it with my sister-in-law and we can have a competition over who got more sleep last night. Um, <laughs> all the way to um, you know, novel crowdsource approaches to solving important verification problems. So that, that data collection can really um, span a, a large spectrum from a passive collection of data that that's occurring naturally in online forums to more active um, collections where we're seeking input from individuals. And um, so in this panel, we'll really focus on some of the opportunities and challenges that are posed by uh, the growth of that information and technologies. Um, so the first question that I'd like to pose to the panel is, um, what are some of the opportunities for uh, the nonproliferation and nuclear security communities to start uh, engaging and using open source information and uh, technologies. Who'd like to start? Maynard's got the longest notes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I guess I, I'll start. So there are, are a myriad way of, array of opportunities uh, for the community to use open source information. Um, and uh, I participated recently in um, State Department uh, funded studies that uh, took advantage of uh, or looked into some of these. And so there are imaging um, technologies or programs that allow you to do um, temporal analysis of uh, and time history analysis of uh, images to, to do change detection. Um, there are uh, programs uh, that we use that use natural language processing um, in strategic languages like Russian, Chinese, Farsi, Arabic to look for uh, worldwide indicators of potential uh, proliferation um, and also uh, to be able to look in the social media sphere for um, things like uh, medical isotope shipments that could be potentially diverted, um, dual use technologies that could be used for uh, nuclear material um, uh, processing. And so a lot of these um, technologies and, and programs are, are in the uh, open arena and can be used by um, uh, kind of amateur uh, 
you know, crowdsourced uh, um, in individuals who are interested in uh, you know tracking some of these. And there there are some dangers, uh, some classic cases uh, that we can talk about later, where you know some of this information was um, misconstrued and um, and speaks to uh, the need for expert mediation um, of, of these information streams. I want to just tuck in what you said on, on the idea of crowdsourcing. Um, one of the things I always try to, to bring home to people when we talk about this, this new world we're, we're in in terms of open source information and open source analysis is that we, we tend when we talk to kind of break it into two pieces. There's sort of us, the experts, and there's you, the audience. And the reality is that's not the way the world works anymore. Um, when we talk about these technologies today, we're talking about technologies that have open access. And in many cases, um, you may not be a nuclear specialist or a specialist in bioweapons, but maybe you're a statistician and you really understand better than we would so what some of these signals and indicators may be from some of this open technology that's out there. So the idea of the t technologies and the availability of the technology, I think, is what is fundamentally different today than it used to be in terms of analysis. And uh, you, you touched on crowdsourcing. Um, when we think of the kind of new media tools and social media tools, all of us immediately grasp for the Facebooks and the Twitters and these type of things. But one of the most powerful tools that are out there for nonproliferation use is simple crowdsourcing. And uh, things like these scientific platforms such as Innocentive, where governments can now turn to teams of scientists and say, look, we're having a real hard time monitoring this particular issue or determining the forensics of this particular nuclear event. And we would like scientists on their own to team on their own and try to solve these problems. That's a, a colossal step forward in terms of a capability for the nonproliferation community to really solve these extremely difficult challenges. Yeah, so I want to add a little background. Many of you may know this, but it's, it's useful to know for framing what you guys are saying, that there's a huge um, a disparity between how easy it is to hide nuclear materials and how easy it is to find nuclear materials. It's really cheap and inexpensive to hide them. It's really expensive and difficult to find them. So for example, uh, about 10 centimeters of water, just plain old water, well, it's California. So a lot of water, 10 centimeters, full 10 centimeters cuts gamma radiation by about half and absorbs neutrons. And so if you want to hide nuclear material, if I hand it to any of these three guys and said, you've got 20 minutes, hide it on campus so we can't find it, they'll succeed, right? So we've got this asymmetry, which means that we're compelled to look for every increment forward we can make in determining whether potential proliferation may be going on. So, it's, so I'm, I'm sort of inverting the question more to, we have to use open information, however we can productively use it, because if someone wants to hide things, they can hide things. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, how we can effectively uh, use it, but it's, it's how you can effectively you know, collect it. And the idea is that hopefully the more eyes and the more ears on the topic, hopefully the more likely you'll get good ground truth. Yes, although I'm, I'm a little jumpy on that. You know, people like to, so many of you may have heard the Red Balloon Challenge. DARPA sponsored a Red Balloon Challenge. They put up, I think, 13, 10, some small number of balloons across the country and then challenged people to find them accurately. And there were people who were hacking it to make it impossible to find and so on. It was, so it's often held up as an example of open information, open exchange, working very effectively to localize things. But the counterexample is during when the Boston bombings happened, the Reddit community, which is a huge community, said, hey, we're open source, let's crowdsource, let's see, we know a lot, we've got a lot of eyes on the ground, can we figure it out? And they did figure it out. Unfortunately, they figured it out wrongly and accused the wrong people, right? So, so the comment earlier, I think, um, and you said about, yeah, we need to do the crowdsourcing and we need to have domain experts. For vetting. To, it's, it's both and. Right. Uh -huh. So I think this leads into a great discussion of this concept of the wisdom of crowds and how when we put many minds together, we can start to get a stronger answer than if we have individual, um, either individuals of the public or maybe these individual uh, highly uh, trained experts working together. So, I mean, 
when we're talking about nuclear events, um, things that would be of interest to the nuclear security and, and nonproliferation communities, these tend to be highly scientific, technical things that we're looking for rather than a balloon, uh, for example. So how much trust can we put into the public uh, for things like this? And at what point um, does that sort of information become actionable either by governments or verification bodies? So I think if you break the, the problem into two pieces, so the first part is how much trust can you put into the public as gatherers of information? I think you can put a lot of trust because people take photographs, they have recordings, they have information, they've talked to people. So, I mean, the police department, when there's a, an investigation going on, they don't say, well, only police can come up with evidence. They expect the public to produce the evidence. I think we can have a lot of confidence that the evidence will be found. Now, judging the evidence, determining whether that indeed is a verification uh, task that needs to be followed up on, whether that's a violation of a particular treaty or something like that, I think that clearly is the realm of experts because you never, just because you have a picture of some carcass on the beach doesn't necessarily mean it's a sea monster. So, so to add to um, Brian's um, uh, statements, we all know, you know, this generation is a uh, reports uh, too much information <laughs> about their ambient environment, right? <laughs> and so I think, um, and you know, there are data points, um, as pointed out earlier, uh, about you know tremendous, uh, you know, like for example, the Bin Laden raid. Um, that was first reported on social media by a Pakistani expat who was living in Abbottabad who heard the choppers in the middle of the night and tweeted about it. Um, it had to, you know, propagate through the Twitterverse and correlated, you know, with when it was tweeted to determine that that was really the official first report mm -hmm. before, you know, the president came on television to say, you know, it was a su successful raid, but that was just somebody tweeting about their environment. And a project, you know, I did for the State Department uh, a year ago on treaty verification uh, by looking at social media, we were looking at indicators um, in China about sickness, um, whether people were reporting, um, you know, that they were ill or there any Fever. animal die-offs as a indicator of a potential uh, you know, accident at a uh, undeclared uh, you know chemical weapons facility. Um, it turns out, you know, these were you know it was avian flu, and um, you know farmers getting rid of dead pigs in the Shanghai River. But you know we saw these things first in social media because people were tweeting and blogging and 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 talking about it. So I think there's you know as Brian said, great power in the crowd that needs to be uh, verified uh, by experts. So one thing that Brian mentioned was that the public is good collectors in, thing, in terms of things like photographs, right. uh, because that's you know a little bit easier for for experts to actually um, look at and make judgments on. So Frank, I was wondering if you would comment on that based on your um, <coughs> imagery analysis experience. Okay. Well. Uh, there's lots of uh, social media uh, imagery uh, posting websites. I um, mean, you think of Panoramio, and you think of um, well, Pinterest, and I guess Instagram. I mean, there's always uh, pictures being posted out there. Some of the more famous ones are, uh, you know, that had relevance was the ICBM rolling off the road, and people were. You know, tweeting the the picture, and if you look at it, you'll say yes, it, indeed, it's you know an ICBM tell off the side of the road in Russia, um, and you wouldn't have been able to make that call without seeing that image, you know, of the vehicle over on its side and the soldiers standing around going, now what do we do, you know? But um, and I think you know Rose Gottmuller's brought that up as one of the classic examples, and it really is a, a classic exemplar. So um, that that's one example. Um, then there's a, a different kind of imagery um, 
uh, crowdsourcing, so to speak, in that uh, people will find things on, on Google Earth and they'll highlight it. So you have lots of people around the world looking at Google Earth saying, what's this? This is strange. Look at this mystery complex, whatever. And so it pops up and then sometimes it goes viral and sometimes it goes viral in a short period of time and gets put out real quick because someone will look at it and say, oh, no, it's not that. It's this. And, and then you, you sort of, it gets filtered and it's sort of like, it's, as you mentioned, uh, you, know, you get closer to the asymptote, uh, asymptote of truth with the more eyes looking at it, it's sort of self-regulating. I used to say, you know, like Wiki, uh, Wikipedia. And, and that's one example. Another, another thing is labeling. Um, you have Wikimapia and Google Earth blogs where people label things. So the crowd is labeling everything under the sun that you can see in, on Google Earth. Sometimes they're completely wrong. It's like people posting their tourist photos and they'll say, oh, here I am at the Tower of Pisa and it's in the middle of the Amazon or something. You know, how that happens, I don't know, but it does. Um, so again, yeah, it takes someone, you know, some expert to, to say that's indeed a tell that rolled off the road, but it's nice that someone took the picture. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have had it otherwise if it wasn't for that posting on the social media. I don't know if that answer, answered it. Well, I want to do a follow-up on that. There's, there's a couple of, uh, I think, I mean, you guys should like, argue with me if you, if you think <laughs> it's right. But, but what we're talking about is incidents and accidents. We're not talking about I mean, the volume of photos of people's dinner, <laughs> right? There's really a lot of those. But if I was going to build a device, I would go rent a industrial storage area, you know, just not even an area, just a couple sheds in Los Angeles, and it would look just like an industrial storage shed. It would be the most unremarkable thing ever, and the unremarkability would make it invisible because the volume of photos people are taking. I mean, for, for just a quick heuristic, uh, you have, everyone in this room has seen more photos today than normal people would see in a lifetime in 1800. And of all the photos ever taken, more than half of them are in the last two years, and I'm sure that that's accelerating. <laughs> so the volume of material and the, what, where crowdsourcing to me seems most applicable is for accidents and incidents with things that are at least somewhat familiar. You know, so the example of the missile off of the truck causing a traffic jam. Hey, there's a traffic jam. What's causing it? Everyone's curious. Oh, look, I can take pictures, right? And it's a missile, so it's something very recognizable, whereas a what, 30B container of UF6 looks like just some truck that's carrying, it looks like some truck. It's very un, unnoticeable. So I think it's tricky. I mean, the tail number example where, where people, there's people who like really like tail numbers of airplanes, which is how the, the CIA black extradition project program was discovered. That was crowdsourcing, right? Because for reasons that aren't clear to me, people were fascinated by airplane tail, tail numbers, numbers. Right. <laughs> right? And so, but I guess the point is that there's this mix of things that, uh, that non-experts will have a consensus on. That looks like a missile, we all agree, and it's anomalous, right? So it's much easier to find anomalous things that stand out that are recognizable without specialized training than it is to find stuff that is hard to find for experts, even if you have the right images. Right? Well, but, that, but there's a big problem of the number of images is just vast. But, uh, but to follow up on that point about an innocuous warehouse where somebody's doing you know, nefarious things for weapons of mass destruction or something, if, if let's say they had a warhead in a van sitting in a warehouse you know, in an industrial area, you wouldn't see it. But if it's driving out on the road and it gets in a car accident and the thing falls out, Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, people will say, I don't know what it is, but look at this. <laughs> you know, and then pretty soon someone will say, hey, I know what that is. Yeah, no, precisely. I, I completely agree. But so, it's, it's kind of hit or miss for a systematic approach. Right, it is hit or miss, but, but it's one other data point that you might not have otherwise. That's the key. 100% agreement. Okay. Yeah, so two points I'd like to make is, you know, as an analyst and somebody, you know, in this community, I'm, I'm not looking for you know, the anom anomalous building, I'm looking for an indicator that you might be playing with this stuff. And, you know, a classic example, you know, that has, uh, um, you know, before the internet was 
the uh, sarin gas attack in Japan mm -hmm. uh, by Aum Shinriko. Um, there were, you know, after, you know, we did after action on that and were uh, not surprised, but, you know, the signal was, was there that there were animal die offs around the facility that they were mixing the sarin gas at. And so, um, you know, we can do the forensics around uh, nuclear material handling um, to see, uh, uh, you know, what those tells are. And we, we've seen cases, you know, in Mexico, for example, where uh, some medical isotopes were, were missing and, and people, uh, you know, got irradiated. Um, so, you know, I would, you know, look for, uh, you know, for those um, indicators um, um, as, uh, as potential tells. Yeah, I, I agree. One of the ones that I would really like to do is look at infrasound. You know, so people, when there's haunted houses, when we'll talk about haunted houses, it's often associated with infrasound, which is sound below the level at which we can hear, we can still sense it. And we wanted to look at uh, underground explosions, mm -hmm. which generate infrasound, and see if we could get haunting mm -hmm. reports in social media in a cons you know, these concentric <laughs> circles of... <laughs> Curse whoever did not fund that. <laughs> <laughs> brings up an interesting question when we move from um, these events from kind of non-state actors or accidents that are um, you know happening that reporting of these things kind of brings about a greater public good um, when we start to shift over to looking at um, maybe state level proliferation what are some of the implications of using that citizen generated data, either social, ethical, political type implications that we need to be aware of as a verification community? Well, I mean, the whole thing kind of breaks down right there, right? Um, the issue, we, we've, we had a workshop that Maynard sponsored and Bethany and Erica participated in, and this looked at precisely that hard question. Um, we all forget, because <laughs> we're in it every day, but I mean, the internet is brand new. And Frank and I looked at this in a paper we did, is that you know, it took about 50 years or more before there was sort of a theory, an academic theory, of how radio was affecting communications. Um, and so we are at the very, very beginning of how the internet is affecting law and legal aspects and how these treaties should be interpreted in light of that kind of thing. Um, the idea of public responsibility and accountability for treaty verification is an old, old idea. That's the whole idea of societal verification. And uh, you know, Joseph Roblat brought it up and kind of revitalized it in the 90s, and Rose Gottemiller, our undersecretary for um, arms control, has you know, kind of repopularized it again. But the idea was basically, every time there's an arms control treaty, we need to make it binding as a legal law in the domestic legislation of every country that signs it that a violation is a violation and you are obligated to report it. So in theory, that sounds wonderful. In practice in places like North Korea or even in the United States, not so much. And I just think um, those are, are sincerely difficult, hard questions to address and we just aren't far enough down the road yet to figure out how to do it. And we haven't even really figured out what does it mean if Google can design an autonomous car. And you can read every day in the New York Times the freak out over the legal ramifications of the insurance questions. Take that, you know, but maybe an order of magnitude or two, and that's what we're talking about in legal adjudication of treaty verifications involving querying citizens and then having state parties make decisions. But there's also, there's also non-citizen information, so right. that as we, you know, aerial imagery, satellite imagery is becoming ubiquitous, it's a big commercial market, mm -hmm. and so pretty soon we're gonna have daily satellite imagery of everywhere. And All so, the time. Yeah, all the time. Right. Yeah, and so, so the idea that, for example, you could look and say, yeah, look, we've got, we've got subsidence, we've got cracked stones in a circle, we have this place that was green last week is now brown because the water table moved. <coughs> this calls for an inspection, right? And I think, I think that we're probably all in agreement that, that none of us think of this as being a standalone answer, but more of as a complementary thing that extends the technical means that, and the legal means that we do have available to us. Right, so that, that would be an example of something where open information could trigger something, even in a country where it was much more restricted, without endangering any citizens who were trying to give us that information, because that's, that's a big deal. Right, if I'm, if I'm in Niger and I'm loading 
boxes on the, on the train, and the manifest says 20 and I only owed a 19, you know, I, if I go tell someone, that could really not have good outcomes for my family and myself, right? So, but, the, but there's still stuff, there's still stuff. Right. Some of this was addressed in that, in that paper. You might give a plug for the NTI paper as well, <laughs> the, the MIS paper. Right. No, really, I mean, it, just to refer people, maybe as it references at the end of this, just say, check out the NTI website on societal verification. Oh, but I want to ask a follow-up question just about international law, and you guys know more about this than I do. My understanding is one of the problems with writing a treaty is that you specify what can and can't be done, but because the technology moves really rapidly, how does that, how does that work with respect to societal or open verification? Not very well. So I, <laughs> one of my jobs uh, when I was in the Army was I was a strategic arms reduction treaty missile inspector with the Russians. And the treaty would allow you, that you, would, you had a, basically sort of a picture book that were standard photos of various treaty obligated equipment. So you'd have a missile on a truck, you'd have a picture, and the picture was from the left to the right or something like this. And uh, so occasionally you, they would bring their truck out and show it to you and they would display it, you know, just to mess with you from the right to the left. And you would say, well, that's not in accordance with the treaty, it should be left to right, so we're gonna take a picture. So there were a lot of these kind of instances where you took pictures of things. And what did you use? The treaty was you know, signed 1991 and you had a Polaroid camera. And that's what was authorized. And everybody had digital cameras and as soon as you showed up in country, the Russians would you know, pat you down, take all your digital cameras and throw them in a box. And you had a Polaroid camera. And you can imagine how well a Polaroid camera works in the winter of Siberia, right? <laughs> not, not so well. I mean, you, there's a lot of shaking trying to get that thing to develop. Um, so, how did you add your digital camera, which is you know, state of the art, same thing everybody's using? You had to go through the entire uh, treaty, treaty verification, right. treaty you know, um, adjudication. negotiation and adjudication process to have this piece of equipment adopted by both sides. So it's, it's a big, big problem because you're dealing with states parties and they don't want to, for a variety of reasons, not just the legitimate concern of being spied on or whatever, but just also the illegitimate concern of just, no, we're just gonna make it hard for you. Because you have Siberia and we don't. <laughs> so. Um, so I think uh, the organizers are gonna be passing through uh, the aisles to collect your questions now. So if you have any of those, please try to kind of pass them to the end so that we can um, get those and, and get them addressed on the panel as well. Um, and I'd like to take that opportunity also to, to shift the discussion a little bit. So we've, we've talked about a few different sources of information. We've talked about imagery and um, you know some of the social media platforms, but are all of these information sources equal and how, what are some of the, the lesser known sources of data that we might use to support um, non-proliferation verification and how can they be used? Okay, I'll start off only because I, I, I like to promote w uh, Wikimapia. Um, it's a great uh, venue for people labeling things and it's not really well known and uh, it, it's, you can download it as a KML layer onto Google Earth so, uh, and it seems to be used pretty broadly around the world. Um, doesn't matter, it was, from what I can tell, based on everything I've read, it was created by uh, a Russian who has links to the GRU, the military intelligence of the former Soviet Union and now Russia. And um, they created it as an adjunct to Google Earth. So they said, hey, Google Earth is great, how can we use this as an intelligence gathering tool I know, we'll make it so people can label things. <laughs> and so if it's good for them, it's good for us. Um, and it's funny because when you think uh, Google Earth was effectively created by the CIA, it makes it even more interesting. <laughs> and I say that only because if most people may not be aware, but uh, Keyhole was the company that was bought by Google and changed the name to Google Earth. It was called Keyhole. It was originally funded uh, in part through uh, the venture capitalist uh, uh, effort set up by the CIA called InQtel. So it was a, a Silicon Valley seed company that the, the CIA had. So, so you had the CIA helps to create Google Earth and then you have the, the Russians help create, uh, the Russian intelligence organization effectively 
help create Wikimappy and they work together perfectly. So that's one of the social venues that's uh, not really well known. Uh, another thing that I found recently was uh, a thing called EcoSec or EchoSec. And it, it does, it's kind of um, a broad area uh, tool. It's sort of a, what, what's a meta search engine for Instagram, Foursquare, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and it pops up in a geospatial context. You have a map, and then all the things you can zoom in on, like let's say you zoom in on your uh, local high school, you'll find every Instagram from every kid and all kinds of stuff. And uh, then you can cross check where the people have been, and you can effectively do the same for a nuclear research center, let's say. And you may find something, you may find a total dead zone where there's no labeling at a nuclear research center. But in the neighborhood, people are posting, and then you can sort of build a network of interactions, and you might be able to find other sites that you didn't know about through the linking. So those are so. Well, actually, it brings up something that, that is underneath that that people often don't think of when they think of open source stuff, which is open source software. Which is, and as a software guy, we came up with open source. I would just like to say, if you <laughs> have met source code, and but the the various algorithms. I mean, well, it's like a continuation calendar. of yeah. how science works, uh -huh. but publishing it as code means you can run it and modify it. And we've seen huge advances in what we're capable of doing thanks to the ability to, here's my code. Oh, okay, well, I improved the algorithm or I altered the... That's true. Yeah. So in terms of, of things you don't normally think of, but in fact is, is a really rich place uh, for community is, is open source software. Right. If you're a normal person, you use really a lot of it every day without necessarily even knowing it. Actually, I would be astonished if it wasn't true that every single person in this room used quite a bit of open source software daily. And you know, if you're using a Mac, you're using a whole bunch of open source software that's hidden under there. Right. Well, for, for apps and things. But you know what, since you mentioned that, there's one that we just started using. I, I just started playing with just out of curiosity. Uh, if you go to the Google Earth engine, you can adapt uh, um, the Landsat thermal data and actually write your own script using the open source information. And you can actually get thermal data on nuclear sites around the world and see what's hot and what's not <laughs> in right. ways that you wouldn't have thought possible. But it's out there. It's, it's data that's freely available. It's big data. But, but you can sift it real quick because you just set the parrot, you know. Right, and because people built you the tools. Right. Uh -huh. And they didn't know you wanted to do that. They just thought this would be cool. <laughs> well, really, I mean, because right, there's right. a lot of stuff out there yeah. where. So, I mean, is that that's the kind of thing you're trying to drive at, right? So, yeah. things that you might not otherwise think of that, in fact, give you a lot of power. Right. So I mean, the, the other one. I mean, I've got to. I've got to say, it's really short. Programming languages are virtually free now. And back when I, in the earlier part of my career, it would cost you know a C compiler cost ten thousand dollars. And that was when a house in Santa Barbara cost $35,000, right? Ada compilers started at $25,000 a seat. And now you're kind of astonished and appalled if someone wants you to like, pay for a programming language. What, what is that? <laughs> right? So continuing this, this notion of getting tools into people's hands. Well, and, and not just tools, but you can get the processing. You can get the data storage. You know, it's all this huge amount of access that's free. You know, via the cloud, you know, or whatever. I mean, you wouldn't have imagined that you could have all those things at your disposal, right? And you can operate them from your smartphone, you know, or a tablet or whatever. So I'll throw in my my ideas, and I, I have to say it because every time I come to Berkeley, inevitably I'll end up behind someone, and they've got the famous bumper sticker, you know, "Think globally, act locally." And our big problem in terms of audiences I deal with in the United States is we tend to think very locally in terms of social media. The greatest tre treasure trove of, of cool things related to our field are on foreign social media sites. So the Russian site, Vokontaktia, or Adnoklasniki, if you speak Chinese, go to Sino Weibo. There is amazing right, right. stuff out there. And the fact that we all want to look at Facebook and look at the map of Facebook and say, oh, look, they're in England now. Wow. Um, that's not where the problems are. The problems are in countries like Russia and the Koreas and the Arab-speaking nations. And that's, they're not on necessarily Facebook. They're on some of these other sites. So to get on there and dig through those, or you, you find amazing things. Well, that, I was on that Ukraine. 
Well, it, Ukraine, right, yeah. yeah. You can, if you're looking for what's happening in Ukraine, that's all on uh, Adno Klasniki of Kontakte. I mean, daily images and, and geolocated photographs and, and you know, uh, people talking about their experiences there. It's, it's just tremendous. And if you're in our field, you can go to Vukontakte and there's actually a user group that are collectors of loose radiological sources. <laughs> right. um, because, you know, there's a there's lot a of lot. stuff. There's a lot. And Actually, it's, have, it's awesome. What a hobby. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and you'll see, I mean, there's acres and acres of, you know, I found this. It's kind of warm. What is it? Um, and you'll have some, you know, guy who it's one of these and it's from that and it goes to this device. And, I mean, it's astonishing what's out there. So if you're just looking in English, you're missing three quarters or more of the good stuff. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to add to that, uh, you know, the, the thread going on here and, and plug my favorite, uh, or one of my favorite tools that was funded by InQtel and Google Ventures, um, only company to have that pedigree, and it's co called Recorded Future. Mm -hmm. And so they um, do natural language processing of all of these strategic languages, as Brian was intimating, uh, to give you visibility into what's being said in these different regions. So. They do Mandarin, Chinese, Russian, Arabic, Farsi, Spanish, French, Japanese, um, and you're able to see uh, what you know these sites are saying about any topic. And you know one of their secret sauces is the temporal component, which um, does text analytics to uh, infer a time uh, stamp for. Uh, what's being said. So if somebody's talking about protesting in the future, saying, you know, brothers, let's, you know, meet at the uh, uh, American embassy, you know, on, on such and such a date, it will flag that. And so this tool is being used by governments, by companies to uh, essentially understand the protest environment. So people can take proactive actions. Um, we were using it uh, to look for indicators of uh, you know, potential treaty violations by looking at sickness and illness and, um, and then you know, reporting in, in native language uh, media. So that's my plug. Excellent. Well, we've talked about a lot of um, novel information sources or sources that people might not <coughs> typically expect. And I wonder if we could take just a moment or two to talk about um, some of the new approaches to analyzing that data. So uh, Brian, you mentioned at the outset that someone could be a statistician and all of a sudden have this role in nonproliferation that wasn't previously expected. But what are some of the um, kind of cutting edge research areas in computer science or computational linguistics or statistics or some of the other areas uh, where um, we might be able to find new uh, analysts who are experts in, in this field? Well, we just got a grant just recently from the Defense Threat Reduction Agency uh, where um, I'm bringing my tiny bit of nonproliferation expertise to a colleague's colossal amount of computational linguistical expertise. Uh, and we're looking at uh, so-called deep learning, which is how do you better parse uh, grammar to understand what's being said and what are the indicators that would tend to lead to you in these, in these colossal data sets to think that they're talking about weapons of mass destruction. So the idea of co uh, computational linguistics, which is something that we in the nonproliferation community, to my knowledge, haven't really spent a lot of time on, uh, with respect to you know language and actually getting down to the grammars of language, and I guess you've done some work on ontologies and this kind of thing. <coughs> right. Um, yeah, the, it's so it's there. very cool stuff. There's some yeah. great stuff going on. There is also a caution, which is that jargon, jargon, native language jargon, be very difficult. So a lot of statistical translation is based on documents that are official documents that are written in multiple languages. I mean, Google Translate got a huge jump thanks to the European Commission because they have all these identical content identical legal documents in 19 languages. Mm. And so it's an awesome place to say this means this is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. But I, you know, I just saw just casually someone said that uh, they were totally killing it on their goals for the year. And it was offhand remark, we all know just what they meant, but in terms of 
building systems that are capable of, of not swamping you with false positives, killing it with respect to their goals for the year does not mean killing anything, <laughs> right? Okay. And you know, weapons of mass chocolate, which is a phrase that I've heard from female friends, not from male friends to date. <laughs> um, you know, there's also, so, so yeah, deep learning is pretty cool. I mean, basically that's just like multi-layer neural nets where you have a lot of computation. It's cool, it's, I, I like it. And in addition, but we still have this problem of idiom in language and then people who believe they're being watched using idiom to make it very difficult to penetrate, right? If anybody, it's unlikely, if anybody's read uh, Mes Mesro's book about jazz in the 40s, he has a chapter that is totally in jazz idiom and it's impenetrable to, to a normal English speaker, right? But, it, but it's actually, as I think of it, I've been accused of being impenetrable to normal English speakers too. <laughs> you know, or, or in, in any event, it's, it is, it's really powerful stuff and just like anything else, we, we get no free ride. <clears throat> Computation is not a substitute for knowing what the thing is you're looking for and and then finding that in masses of data. Because the, the thing we gotta keep in mind is the volume of data is just, it's not something we can encompass mentally. We have words for it, but. Yeah, they call it big data, data mining. Yeah, but the big part. Is, it's too big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well you know, your, your comment about, about we could look at it on our cell phones, well that, you know, a normal, at, at CES, at the electronics show, um, Nvidia showed a new cheap, lightweight chip for cell phones that is processing equivalent to the fastest supercomputer in the world in 2000, right? I mean, the, the speed, the volume, it's just, it's really big. We, have, we don't have good words for it. Saying exabytes, we can say exabytes, but in terms of imagining what an exabyte is relative to normal life. Okay. Another thing we're talking about, um trolling uh, language and trying to parse things and, and do this, uh, trying to find someone who's, you're, you're think, we're thinking uranium or bomb or whatever, but the reality is then if you look at the Manhattan Project, they call it the gadget. You right. Know, what, how many times are you gonna find the word gadget? You know, probably a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that makes it tough. We made the mistake of once, we were building stuff that was sort of secret and we called it a thing. And that was a mistake because, because <laughs> whenever we talked to our customers, they would ask about the thing, but it was like, do you mean the thing or just mean the thing? <laughs> it was a bad word choice, bad choice of names. Anyway, yes. So I think with that, uh, we'll move to some of the questions from our audience. Um, the first one is, could open source information jeopardize national security and potentially be destabilizing? Well, there was, yes. a court, there, yeah, <laughs> there was a court case where, you know, the people of Y-12 who walked in, I mean, they cut the fences and walked in, they were convicted of damaging national security. I mean, to me, that was sort of absurd, because what I thought they showed was that we need to get it together on <laughs> taking care of our materials. But no, their conviction was, in fact, uh, sabotage was part of the conviction. They were damaging national security. In terms of destabilization, that one wasn't destabilizing, but. Well, but if you expose vulnerabilities, right. that, that could be destabilizing. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, what you really should do is fire the people responsible <laughs> for. <laughs> that was pretty bad. 82 year old nuns breaking into your, I mean, it's not like this is a SEAL attacks yeah. team. But I mean, you can make an easy argument, not in the nuclear sphere, but you know, you could say that the Abu Ghraib uh, investigation where those photographs were splashed all over the place. That was that destabilizing. Was destabilizing. That it was incredibly different. strategically damaging to the United States. And that was open source information. Right. So yes. So yes, yeah. okay, <laughs> we have consensus. Um, so one thing that's been in the news quite a bit lately are the uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran. Um, so this question comes from the audience. Uh, can open source play a role in Iran? And what sort of role would that be? Hopefully they'll give us tip-offs where they're hiding things that they say they are not. Hopefully, if they're if they're hiding, then we hope it gets exposed. Right. Um, so the the key to this deal is verification, and if open source can help do a better job overall by bringing in other information that may not be readily available through other means, then great. And that's how, if you think back. 
It was open source that provided the information about Natanz, about Calais Electric, about Lashkar Abad, all of those facilities that were previously unknown in, you know, to the world until they were made known by a dissident group. And so as far as I'm concerned, when the dissident group makes it public, it's open source. <laughs> so yes, it can definitely help. Okay. Everyone's shaking their heads in agreement. Um, so we've, we've talked about a few cases of accidents or, or highly public, um, highly visible occurrences. So does open source um, and, and crowdsourcing information rely solely on luck um, in this type of reporting of anomalous events, or can there be a more systematic approach? That's a little bit of a trick question, because if you think of sensing as being ubiquitous, I mean, most people in the audience, most people who may be viewing a webcast have a, have a, a cell phone, and that has a magnetometer in it, it has an accelerometer in it, it has a camera in it, it has a microphone in it, it has lots and lots of sensing and lots of processing power, and those are ubiquitous. And it's GPS. And GPS. Right. And actually, there's a few other things that are in there too, because it measures its own temperature, it measures the outside temperature, and some of them actually measure barometric pressure as well, because right. it preserves the battery. There's lots of stuff. There's lots of sensing inside there. But the notion of ubiquitous sensing means that the, the luck versus systematization, the systematization, to me, you know, following something you said earlier, has to do with what do you do with data hygiene? So if you're a data scientist, you spend roughly 95% of your time doing data hygiene, and only about 5% doing the analysis. The analysis is the thing that's cool and glamorous, but mostly what you're doing is trying to clean your data so you can actually see things in it, because you've got a lot of garbage. But in terms of systematicity, the place where it comes in is the data hygiene is extracting where things are interesting, where should we look closer, because the volume of, of sensing almost everywhere, I mean, I was at, a, at a, a meeting and people who were doing very low cost solar panels in rural Africa were talking about these guys and they had the guy in the village whose job was to walk two, three miles to the road, take the battery out of the car, bring it back to the village. They would all use it to charge their cell phones, which was the only electronics they had. They didn't have electric lights, but they had cell phones. And then they would take the battery back and put it back in the car. That's how they would charge it. So this sensing is ubiquitous. So we're going to have a flood of data from almost everywhere. So it's not a matter of luck of having images, sound recordings, and so on of, of events. It's more a matter of how do, we, process. how do we process? How do we separate overwhelmingly chaff? You know, I don't, I'm going to go out on a limb, but I'm betting not a single picture of someone's dinner at a restaurant contains nonproliferation relevant information. <laughs> I could be mistaken about that. I, I may be proved wrong, but you know, there's some easy filtering, but some of the filtering Here's a picture of a large facility. Do we care? <laughs> I don't know, right? And, but how much, how much time do we have? How much capability do we have to, to down classify so some human can look at that? Because if I am stacking 90 pages of, of documents on your desk every day, which is not uncommon for analysts, you know, here's, here's, there's something good in one of these, these 150,000 right. right. photographs. It, right. Can you find the right one? Probably not. <laughs> but, but kind of inversely, though, if you get a tip-off, like, for instance, there was, the, uh, there was the NCRI just recently came out and said there's this new underground uranium enrichment facility in northeast Tehran. And then Jeffrey Lewis used some social media and so, or some things that were available, or not, he didn't, but he found someone else who did. He was able to do some searching. And they were actually able to find a vehicle track that somebody had posted of driving into that facility. And he found what that person did for a living and actually was able to email that person and say, why were you there? And turned out it was a, bad, a security badge manufacturing facility, you know, processing facility. And, and he would have never found that had he not been tipped to look for it, but the way he was told to look for it was because he, it was alleged to have been an underground uranium enrichment facility. So, but I mean, it's a way of using open source to help resolve f false positives. So. Actually, that's a great story. <laughs> yeah, I just emailed that. the guy, hey, what were you up to? <laughs> well, it turned out he was a non-Iranian. He was uh, a European. Yeah. 
You follow up on that. It's an arms control walk. You know, that, I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. So it, it's a nice segue into the next question in which um, it, it says, in nonproliferation, false positives are, are a potential problem when we're talking about um, state compliance and accusing states of perhaps not uh, being in compliance with their agreements. Um, <clears throat> and they can particularly be a problem uh, when they're generated um, by third parties, potentially deliberately generated by third parties. Um, so is this a, a potential problem for crowdsourced information? I don't see why it's a potential problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how, how do we deal with disinformation? Well, you deal with it in the same way you deal with disinformation in the traditional treaty verification mode. It's not like just because you have a new uh, data source that fundamentally your procedures of handling data are going to change. I mean, we have, for example, recently the United States uh, said that the Russians are out of compliance with the, in, uh, the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty because of some cruise missile testing that they did. So we had some information, some images, and some other open source and classified that kind of pointed in that direction. So that's, that's the very beginning of a very, very long, drawn out, formal process of verification. So the first one is just, or, uh, the first one is just, you know, indication of a possible problem. And then from there on, there are just this long, it's just like, um, just because you're accused of a crime doesn't mean you're going to jail. It's, I mean, there's a, there's a trial, there's evidence gathering, there's, you know, peers who weigh and vet this evidence. You have a judge to make sure that the procedures are followed in a framework that everyone agrees to. And it would be the same type of fact, I think. Um, well, let, let, me, let me give you a scenario and, and, and riff off it, you know, following the same line of thought. So I get a copy of Maya, which is, you know, if you go to the movies, you see these special effects and monsters walking around and so on. That, that's Maya. It's a very cool software. It was written originally in Santa Barbara, where I'm from. Anyway, so I, I create an incident that happened in Port of Los Angeles. And, it, and then I start posting. I post it piecewise and do, you know, clever, thoughtful posting on various social media sites and it's indistinguishable from reality. So whatever incident I want to have created, I can create evidence that is plausible evidence for that. And I can do that as much as I want, wherever I want. How do we, how do we deal with that? Well, I think you deal with it in the same way that we've had people deal with falsified photos coming out of Ukraine. You have an army of bulldogs like Jeffrey Lewis who are out to show that you're falsifying information. So in, in some sense, as long as it's, if it's truly free and open, there are as many people with a dog in the fight to prove that that is a false flag as there are for people to say that it's a true flag. So kind of, kind of we're it's talking about crowdsourcing that. as not only the generation of false positives, but also part of the the uh, invalidation yeah. Yeah, of right. those false Absolutely. positives. Yeah. I mean, you can go, if you go to Twitter and you follow the atrocities in, in Ukraine, I mean, the, the Russian propaganda machine is pretty good, and it's state-sponsored propaganda, but they'll show images of uh, you know, widows and orphans from Syria, and they'll say, see what these Ukrainian bastards are doing to the, to the peaceful people of Donetsk. And then, you know, within a couple hours, someone comes up and finds the original Syria picture right. and shows how the, the, the clothing has it been was, altered yeah, or this was, thing right. is a little bit Photoshop, different. Yeah. And then someone else will come in and say, look, and I've got an overhead image and I can actually show the precise place on the ground where this photo came from and let me match it up and show you. Right. So clearly this is nonsense. And so you have these kind of competing, uh, you know, analysts out there. So I think that I, I'm not as concerned about that kind of, you know, avalanche of false information spilling over into some kind of conflict. A, because there is this natural group of people who want to fight it out in the public arena, and B, you always have a formalized, very careful adjudication process backing it up. Oh, and it's like, the, remember the photo of the four rockets? Right, right yeah, 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 right. Yeah. When it was really only three, and they were photoshopped, and then people pointed out how they photoshopped it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I'm not quite as sanguine, but I still like your answer better than than mine, <laughs> which is basically we're doomed. <laughs> Excuse me. So our, um, our social media followers have some questions as well. Um, and I think this is something that we've started to touch on but haven't gotten into very deeply yet is um, how do you separate the signal from the noise as an analyst? 
Well, um, as a recent analyst, uh, you, you have to look at number of sources, the veracity of the source, um, the, uh, um, the information itself, uh, and it's, um, you know, do a reality check. Do a, um, you know, as an expert or find an expert to, to do a, a check on, on what you're, you're seeing um, as you would with, uh, you know, any kind of journalistic input before you would go to print. So, um, you know, we're, we're held to very high standards before we, you know, accuse a country of doing this or say that, you know, there's a undeclared facility or they're doing some testing that they're not supposed to. So um, I would say it's no different than what you would do using your national technical means. With, with the caveat that, that that's mostly focused on state level actors. And for non-state actors, much more problematic right. because the scale is way different. The distribution right. may be different. The models may be different. It may be transnational. There's a bunch of things that just, even though you still have to do the same stuff, it just makes it that much harder to do, right? I mean, because the other thing is that people are smart. And if they want to create noise to mask signal, they can create noise. Right, I mean, the, it's, if I do that event at the Port of Los Angeles, and I'm actually planning an event at the Port of Los Angeles, but I do that event four or five times prior to the actual event, which looks just like the fake events, then the speed of response to the actual event will diminish, right, because it's just another one of those pranks, right? So there's ways to generate noise intentionally to make it much more difficult for us to separate. And I'm expecting that that, as non-state actors move into this, unfortunately, we would expect that to be part of a regime, right? It's what we would do. And they're just as smart as us. Well, in my case, they're smarter, but you know. <laughs> um, so uh, shifting gears a little bit and to talk about um, some some developing technologies now. Uh, is anyone looking into developing open source techniques for uh, specifically for advanced fuel cycle facilities and how uh, we might be able to uh, verify their proliferation resistance or compliance with non-proliferation treaties? You mean like That's laser isotopic lab. separation or something? I mean, I'm not sure what advanced. Yeah, so can we, can we develop uh, open source techniques that are specific for these emerging nuclear fuel cycle facilities? From our side, we could characterize specific needs of such a facility. It wouldn't be unique, but if we say, yeah, this needs, this needs a bunch of big high voltage lines coming in, as a minimum it has to have this, whatever else it has, then that lays the groundwork for open source to have something to, to latch onto. And the example before, people looking at Google Earth in immense detail, <laughs> Um, that, would be, that would be an example of a place where on our side, if we make certain kinds of information available about the physical constraints that are necessary to do this type of separation, this type of, of reprocessing, then that potentially could be helpful. Does that you mean that like makes a sense, right? A signatures list kind of? Yeah, signature list. Yeah. Here's, here are characteristics that are necessary to say this may be a thing. They're not sufficient, but... But then a question for you guys, you know, you know more about it than I. How, how twitchy is that to put out in public? Considerably, right? so it's, it's <laughs> difficult. Um, you're, so I, I guess the, in general, the answer to the question is, can we develop open source tools or techniques for, for future uh, non-proliferation challenges? The answer is yes, because as the, they, they develop in tandem, so as the challenges develop, techniques develop. I mean, who, Facebook is relatively new. We don't know what Facebook is going to be, what the new Facebook is going to be in five or ten years. We don't know what people's ability to find those indicators. We don't know what the government, the government may decide that, you know, hey, we, we kind of like this open source movement. Um, we're going to start uh, 
crowdsourcing the legislation that covers how these things are going to be uh, found and, and, and what, what information we're going to share about it. All that is possibility. We just don't know right now. So I would say I'm pretty sanguine about the opportunities for open source to help uh, as we move along. Again, I think all of us have said this. Open source tools, techniques, social media, all the stuff that's out there is not necessarily transformative, but it's profoundly additive to the existing processes we have. Right. It's not a panacea either. Right. It's just another useful uh, tool to br or piece of the puzzle to bring to the puzzle. But if some open source developer wants to develop something that looks for snowy fields with ponds that are not frozen, mm -hmm. yeah. that's fine. They can send that over to us because we'll, <laughs> we'll say thank you. <laughs> for the non-nuclear people, that just, that just means that there's, there's hot stuff there's in that heat. pond that's keeping the temperature above what the ambient temperature would be, and we're automatically interested. So if the U.S. government were to take up crowdsourcing as part of its um, non-proliferation interest, uh, what's the possibility um, that that information might be shared back out to the public to support some of its um, analysis activities rather than just interpreted internally? This is a question from, I think, a, a budding analyst in the crowd. <laughs> well, it depends on the platform, right? Because some of the crowdsource platforms are open to begin with, so all the information that's coming in is visible to all the players. That's one of the key tenets of crowdsourcing is you have to have a feedback mechanism, otherwise the crowd gets lost and doesn't know kind of which direction it's going. So as long as you have that open capacity, I think uh, there's a pretty good chance that the information will be shared again. The government, as we've looked at this problem from, you know, really from inside the glass tower, and how does the government handle and receive and keep, keep those kind of barriers out there, it's difficult. How it's, it's actually harder to, to close the door than it is to leave the door open. But it's, a, it's an ongoing attention inside the government and inside the non-proliferation community. What, what is generally known, what should be known, what shouldn't be known that is known, what isn't known that probably ought to be known. And it's not, I mean, my experience inside the community is we argue about that stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. So what can the nuclear uh, non-proliferation verification community learn um, from other fields who that, that have been participating in open source information collection and crowdsourcing, such as um, epidemiology or missing persons, for example? Well, that it works. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, so I would point to two um, examples, the, the Quake Catcher Network and the Galaxy Zoo right. as uh, yeah, two, yeah, two prime examples of, you know, what one of the co-panelists said, you know, works. So. Uh, as long as there's a consensus on what the phenomena is and that normal people will agree that thing happened, mm -hmm. then it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. So detecting low levels of chemical effluence, probably not. But, but things where, yeah, everybody agrees that's a missile, or everybody agrees that, that this is a facility with barbed wire around it and a bunch of people with beards who look spaced out walking in and out. <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> Not all physicists wear beards and, and then you, actually, I'm the only guy who has a full beard. <laughs> I take that back. But, you, you know, that, that notion that we rely on a consensus on what's being observed, right? Because if there's no consensus on it, then we're not, we're not able to use that as valuable evidence. But you can also, I think, we, all, we, we look at this in kind of a positive way. What can we, you know, epidem epidemiologists are doing something using a crowdsourcing technique and it's really exciting and new and how do we adapt that to the nuclear arena? You can also kind of turn it on its head and say, this didn't work at all. They tried it out, they had everything like Google flu trends. So they had this idea they're gonna track Google flu trends and now after some additional research, it turns out that people were searching for symptoms and they didn't actually have flu. And the CDC with its old school traditional method was more accurate. So there's, there's also lessons, negative lessons there. What did, what did they do wrong? Were they too reliant on particular information? Did they not spend enough time up front clearly defining what these trends, what these uh, terms actually meant in the daily context of people searching for them? So there's, there's information there that we can gather from all these experience, all these experiments that are in kind of tertiary or related fields. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about crowdsourcing, 
is it more effective for us to, um, to look at a large population of amateurs and try to deal with their information, which you know, may or may not be correct, or to train a, a small but significant cadre of experts that we can send on open source verification missions? Depends on the problem set. Is that an either or? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. right. It's not really. Let's say you want a hybrid. You want right. both. And, and yeah, if, yes. And effectively, you always have both because you're going to have the, the crowd doing its thing, and you're going to have little groups, whether it's Monterey or wherever it is, you know, or the people on the East Coast, and there or anywhere in the world, that'll sort of work together as little synergistic teams trying to ferret out, you know, the wheat from the chaff. But you can't separate out the wheat from the chaff if you don't have the chaff to start with, right? And the, and the wheat hopefully in there somewhere. So I think it is a case of both. It's not either. Yeah, and there may be there may be a third element as well. You know, the mention of incentive. So for people who aren't familiar, a bunch of different places in the U.S. government use use public problem sites as well as private organizations use them as well. Well, they'll post a problem that's a difficult problem, and they'll attach an award to it, a monetary award. And then teams will work on it, and whoever solves it gets the award. Well, the notion of having specific problems that are out in the crowd, but where there's some sort of point system or award system for resolving is, is very powerful on a lot of media platforms. It's something we haven't done yet, to my knowledge, but it's something we could do that, that would be a really interesting experiment to do. Actually, we should do that experiment. After we do the haunted house infrasound. <laughs> well, that's an obvious one. <laughs> so what are the steps that need to be taken um, from the international policy side in order to uh, formally incorporate open, open source techniques into verification? Well, so one of the results of our workshop that we had uh, you know, last year here at Berkeley was, uh, you know, a set of recommendations. And one of them was to, um, uh, on uh, uh, track 1.5, if you're familiar with, uh, so that's a parallel track at international negotiations that is kind of, um, uh, you know, unofficial, but uh, speaks to issues that are uh, potential, um, issues or, or techniques that can be incorporated in future treaties. Um, so, so to get some international consensus around what um, societal verification or, or public technical means techniques could be used in, in subsequent uh, treaties. So um, you know, that was one of the, the main recommendations that we came up with was to introduce it to the international community and get feedback on what would be acceptable to our potential treaty, uh, you know, co-signatories. And I think to, to formalize it. But I, I want to back out, back us out a little bit. We use open source. We use journalism sure. all the time. Right. Framing the question is that open source is new. Uh, is is it biases our thinking? We read the papers. Traditional journalism is fantastic. For, that's what they do. They find things out and, and report It's open them. source research. It's open source research, and in some cases, very high quality open source research. So, the, so framing the question is, how do we, how do we continue to add new aspects of open source information as they emerge? And then, yeah, just exactly what you say. What do we agree on? What's acceptable? How are we going to go about doing this? Right. And then, then also the question you asked earlier, how do we set up gates for verifiability? But that becomes problematic in closed societies, you know, where there is no freedom of the press, and it's you know there's a massive filter, and those are the societies that we want to engage. Yes. So in countries like ours, where where we have lots of information and, and things are very open, uh, at what point do we start running into um, privacy? concerns when using these data sets, and how might we mitigate some of those factors? Square one is when you run into privacy concerns, so right at the very beginning. Um, and, and how do you mitigate it? I think um, you begin by just acknowledging what the issue is and trying to, as you develop policies thinking about using this information, 
You need to do it in a public manner, and you need to address the issue head on. In my mind, the, the biggest problem we've had with these kind of things is that anybody with uh, two brain cells that can rub together can look at this and say, this is, a, this is a problematic. And then the answer from most people in the government is, what? You know, looking someplace else and kind of ignoring the issue, hoping it's going to go away. It's not going to go away. And uh, it's not going to go away from uh, the, the privacy concern of the citizen, and it's not going to go away the, the security concern of the government. So I think the first thing that needs to be done is to acknowledge that indeed it's a colossally difficult conundrum and government policy should face it square on and try to do something. Try to craft you know, policies in place that, that attempt to adjust and, and react. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, I would say that if we separate you know, the people, equipment, processes, and material, physical material that's needed to make a bomb, then we have kind of an easier time with, with the equipment, processes, and material than with the people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, how, how are we going to do that? <laughs> well, you know, I, would, I, I don't know. And I, I'm not the smartest guy in the room either. That's why I come to places like Berkeley and say, OK, youngins, solve our problem for us. I've done my job. Uh, so yeah, those, are, those are issues. And I just think we, we don't solve them by not talking about them. So Maynard, you brought up a really good point, which was that some of the countries that are the most closed are those that we want to engage in most. So um, are there information sources that we can um, try to engage from those countries? And, and how might we try to uh, instigate more uh, open source participation in those areas? So difficult problem, but there's some proxies. Um, and so what we found in, in our State Department study, there was or is a, a robust Chinese expat community that uh, you know is just offshore in Han, you know in Taiwan mm -hmm. and other places that reports on things going on in the mainland. If they hear from their relatives. Or that or um, reading it. right, and so so we did um, you know using this temporal analytics tool, um, we we looked at when H seven N nine was first um, reported upon and which news outlets in the native Chinese language uh, press, both expat and in-country, reported first about the government's reaction. And we found that these expat sites were the first to report. And then once they reported and it went it out, spreads back. yeah, it, it got back, and then the Chinese authorities responded very quickly by closing open-air bird markets and and doing some other things that they didn't do with SARS. And then on the Korean Peninsula, you know, we looked at um, towns and cities near the border. And, and Korea, you know, South Korea is the most connected, mm -hmm. you know, uh, society on the planet. And so a wealth of information that, you know, we were able to cull based on the expat, or not the expat, but the community near the border um, that we're getting information by whatever means from by whatever means. yeah sources you know inside North Korea, so there are proxies for uh, um, sources in you know what we call denied areas. But a thing that's open that we don't we don't know we've been assuming that the internet will continue more or less will continue to grow but continue more or less as it's been and that isn't necessarily the case. I mean there's some technical reasons why. You know, IP6 has not been widely adopted. There's some technical reasons why it may not. There's lots of political reasons why it may not. And so how, how that plays out is going to influence what degree of access we have. Yeah, so I like to piggyback on that because I sincerely think that the, the window of access that um, we're going to have to some of these closed societies is, is closing right. because uh, they're going to um, figure out, as China has already done, um, how to sweep up everything, censor everything, filter, um, you know, sources. And so it's going to be an, an arms race. But, um, you know, I think that window of uh, open access and uh, near free flow of information is, is finite. Right. I want to have one, like, I'm, I'm unfortunately sort of 
thinking along the same lines. However, there's a ray of hope, so like we don't need to just like you know savor it if, because it's going to be gone forever. Uh, one of the things you know, Bitcoin people have heard of. A feature of Bitcoin that's an interesting feature is it's what's called peer-to-peer. -peer. So when you go to Google, you're going, you have a client and you're talking to a server. When you talk to the cloud, you're talking to a bunch of servers. And the client-server model, which is, which is, you're a user and there's a centralized place. If I'm the Chinese, if I'm the North Koreans, if any, anybody who wants to control information, I really like the client-server model because I go to this choke point and this choke point, and now I own things. Iran has the second most restricted internet at, in the world after North Korea. And they have like one line to the outside world, maybe two, I can't recall. And during the, the run up to the elections, I think in 2011, they sort of <laughs> cut the line. Peer to peer means you can't do that. Basically, if there's a cell phone within 100 feet and there's a cell phone within 100 feet of that and there's a cell phone within 100 feet of that, you're you're out and there's technical ways to move that information. So there is hope. There is hope for, for an even more open and free environment without actually even a possibility of central control. But it's, it's, we don't know. We don't know what's gonna happen. And so part of how we go forward in open source is we want to make it as easy as possible for that to be, that help non-proliferation. But we're gonna need to be really adaptable because the technology is not going to be a linear extrapolation. It's not just going to be more faster, right? There's lots of forces. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a great example. And there's the offense, the defense, and every defense, someone finds a route around and then finds a way to block. So we're going to see that going on as well in, in the information world. Okay, so we already are seeing that going on. We are, we are seeing that going on. But one of the things that you mentioned about how Iran was most restrictive and it's, you know, it's a... Second most restrictive, second yes. Most, okay, second most The North Koreans set a very high standard. <laughs> <laughs> but even in, in both cases, whether you're talking North Korea or you're talking Iran, um, information is still coming out. And one of the best ways to get information to come out is through commercial satellite imagery. I mean, that's our window into North Korea. And in the case of uh, Iran, I, I think of the work that was done by Nick Hansen. Uh, you know, you've worked with Nick. And uh, he, worked, he did an article for Jane's where he identified a space launch failure, uh, a rocket launch failure on the pad in Iran that to this day has never been covered by any media anywhere in Iran. No, no statements by the Iranian government, no comments by anyone, even our government hasn't responded to this, but yet you can look and see the image where the, it's you know, black blast marks everywhere and broken vehicles and burned vehicles and everything. You know, there's a before, it's nice and clean and pristine with logos painted nice and neat and they're all black afterwards. You know? And he said, hey look, there's a space launch failure and yet no one ever mentioned it. So that's, you know, it's a way of extracting new value-added information that you couldn't get any other way in a very denied area on a very highly sensitive topic just by looking at the image that we never could have done. I mean, only a superpower could have done that 20 years ago, and, and now anyone can do it, and the images are on Google Earth. So it's a different world. Absolutely. So, um, so how can the public intentionally get involved in becoming uh, an information source, if you will, uh, to support nonproliferation efforts? Uh, what are some of the places they can go and activities that they can participate in uh, to get involved? U.S. public or public worldwide? Both. Both okay. <laughs> get on social media and follow the people who are doing it. I mean, uh, Frank's got a social media account. I've got one. Uh, Jeffrey Lewis, who does a lot well, of this stuff. Arms Control Wonk. Arms the Control blogs. Wonk is kind of the hub for these kind of things. Um, Bellingcat, which has uh, been done a lot of That's work. That's another recently. excellent blog that covers UK journalist who covers uh, events in Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine, right. Um, and also did a lot with the, um, and did with the airline that went down in the ocean and all this kind of stuff. Oh, 370. Right. 370. Malaysian. Yeah, Malaysian Airlines. Right. So, I mean, a very easy thing to do if you have a Twitter account, get on there and start, you know, go on there, search nonproliferation, all these names will come up, start following them. And then if you come across things or have ideas or, or run across post. stuff you want to share, post, post it. Yeah. And, they're bulldogs. I mean, they'll be all over your things, believe me. And in, a, in a good, helpful, friendly, you know, contributory manner. Yeah. Great. Um, so what are the biggest uh, challenges to applying open source tools and information 
in the, the nonproliferation and nuclear security world? For me, the biggest challenge is knowing what to look for. What was that? Knowing what to look for. Oh, right. Would you like to expand? Well, <laughs> well you, know, you, don't, you don't know I'm what moving, you don't know. I'm moving materials around. Right. Do you know what to look for? Yeah, it's the case of you don't know what you don't know. And, and you have and to you look don't, for And you don't know unknowns. what it's going to look yeah. like. You don't right. know how to interpret it. You don't know that this is just noise or this is not noise. I'm driving a white van through, you know, we call it the white rental car problem. Yeah. Right? I mean, so the white rental car problem is that there's really, really a lot of white rental cars. And if someone wants to do something, they stick it in the trunk of a white rental car, and it's completely inconspicuous, right? It's, it's the bank, the it's rider, the bank getaway car, the it's a Toyota truck. Camry, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so knowing, for me, the diff most difficult one is knowing what to look for. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I, we, we tend to think of this problem as kind of a technical problem. And, and the more I've looked into it, my sense is that the technical problems will always be solved, but I see the biggest challenges to these are really what we call the LC. So it's uh, the ethical, legal, uh, societal, and security implications of these technologies. And we just, as a, as a society, we haven't come to terms with how to use them. And as a government, we just fundamentally haven't even made the baby steps necessary to begin to incorporate or understand how to use these tools within a framework of a democratic functioning government. So, so to summarize, we don't know what we're looking, looking for, but if we did know what we're looking for, we don't really know how ethically, uh, yeah, how to do it in a way that is a responsible way to do it. Right. Okay, we are not like being we're cheerleaders. Like we, we, we need to be cheerleaders here. There's some neat stuff out there. <laughs> well, because so it I is would, a good thing. So I'd present a, count, a, a counterpoint, you know, at, at you know, post 9-11, you know, there was, you know, things went high order as far as how to protect uh, you know U.S. infrastructure, and so the the New York City Police Department is an example of you know what things could become. So every New York City police officer has a radiation detector, and um, he knows how to use it. He's familiar with uh, the spectra of specific nuclear materials, and has uh, uh, the knowledge to know to do what we call reach back. Uh, so if it's a spectra that he doesn't uh, recognize. Um, there are resources that he can query, you know, within minutes to figure out what that is. Um, so uh, there are there are you know capabilities, and and we've recognized. Um, that uh, you know, detector-enabled we call it Delhi detector-enabled law enforcement is one of the the ways to um, you know detect potential um, you know real-time threats. And so, if you can extrapolate that model to a a citizenry um, and uh, motivated uh, you know to to look for this stuff, there are now apps for your phone that uh, can look for, um, you know, gamma signatures uh, and tell you, uh, you know, what you could be, you know, looking at. So uh, this stuff is out there. As I said, you can extrapolate it to, uh, you know, as a society and and um, and, and go from there. The classic citizens as sensors. Right. Okay. Well, I think that's a nice lead in to our closing question, um, which is how does the work that you're doing uh, contribute to open source verification? You mean individually? Yes. Oh, okay. So you're asking me. Personally, how does my work? Okay. Personally, Frank. <laughs> okay, I, I'm doing open source uh, nuclear nonproliferation research in the sense that right now I'm working on a, a textbook chapter on how to more effectively use commercial satellite imagery with the new era of satellites and sensors that are available. Because we have uh, new sensor suites in space, we have more satellites, more uh, diversity in uh, 
national, you know, it's not just the U.S. now, it's, you know, France and South Korea and Israel and Russia and, you know, there are so many different uh, country to India. So um, the, the diversity of sources, the, the spatial resolution is getting better, uh, spectral resolution is getting better, you know, uh, temporal resolution is getting better in the sense that there are up there are more of them coverage. It's that ubiquitous coverage. You know, what does this all mean uh, for the future of uh, open source nonproliferation research? And so that's what I'm really focusing on is what, what does this new paradigm mean? Because it has changed dramatically. I mean, 15 years ago, we only had one satellite at one meter resolution available to the public. And now there's about 26 uh, either up there or soon to be launched, so that's a, a big change. And that includes radar as well, so. Well, in my current position, I'm working with the head of acquisition at the Pentagon, and so we're looking at next generation technologies, um, you know, for all uh, potential threats. But, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, apps and, and, and things to empower uh, you know, citizenry around the world to uh, potentially uh, either uh, you know knowingly or unknowingly you know contribute uh, data so that it's passively or active right uh, to have us understand you know what the in environment is in denied areas or near denied areas so. Uh, um, so that's you know where we at are, are at at kind of a you know thirty thousand foot view, you know, not down in the weeds um, uh, where I was, but uh, that's what we're doing. So I would say I'm doing four things. First of all, I uh, listen to everything uh, Jeffrey Lewis has to say when he comes running down the hallway screaming, "Look what I found! I want you right. to look at this picture. What is that thing? Tell me about it." How cool is that? So he always wants his military input from me. So I, I do that just as the pro bono work for the for the community. So I think that's that's very important. Um, then we do three, I do three specific projects right now. Um, we at CNS host uh, the, to my knowledge, the world's only completely free and open database of uh, trafficking incidents. So uh, nuclear trafficking, lost radiological sources, incident reports. We have an army of graduate <coughs> students who read in, I think it's 12 languages right now, gather information and populate a gigantic database that talks about all these radiological sources that fell off the truck, were stolen, were trafficked, so-and-so was arrested. Or, or just found, just out. Or just found. Right. So uh, that's one of the projects that I'm the head of right now. Uh, we've been doing that for a number of years. We started doing it in the 90s, looking at uh, the former Soviet states, and then uh, through the grateful, uh, we're grateful to the generous funding of NTI for supporting this project. Uh, but today we're doing it globally. So you can go on there to the NTI web website, and you can find the global trafficking database and pull it up. It's in uh, Excel format, and you can manipulate it and look at it yourself. Uh, second thing we do is uh, I'm doing currently is this uh, giant text mining project with uh, DTRA and my colleagues at Georgia Tech, and that is we're trying to help the Defense Threat Reduction Agency create a better algorithm to identify incidents of uh, WMD relevant text in the sea of free text that's out there. And the last project that we're working on is kind of a hobby project right now. We're hoping to get it kickstarted is um, everyone's heard of Alibaba, this new uh, you know, eBay replacement, kind of yeah, the world's China. largest global marketplace. Well, they trade a colossal amount of things on there, and a lot of the things that they trade are potentially controlled, do-use uh, items. So they, they're trading things, equipment that sh by rights should be under an export control regime right. that isn't. Um, and because it's taking place in China, because it's principally in a area that's not very well regulated, we're gathering the information to demonstrate that this trade is taking place and trying to categorize the types of trades that are happening in order to help the US government export compliance reach out to some of these companies and help them improve their export compliance rules. This is all totally cool, this is great. Well, you even do more okay. than that. You didn't tell all the rest of them, well, like more teaching. Stuff. Come to Monterey, that's <laughs> yeah. all I gotta tell you. <laughs> Which is a really nice town, especially with like sea lions. Yeah. Um, so I want to. I'm doing a few different things, but I want to. I want to go down. It's like it's like we're paired because I'm. In, I'm going to go down all the way in, literally into the weeds. So one of the things. So we're doing some stuff with extreme low power sensing. So there's just things that detect um, 
nonproliferation relevant chemicals that require virtually very close to zero power that you can just like throw, literally throw, uh, or drop into controlled areas, whatever. That is not open source information. But one of the problems you have with any kind of small sensing, and it, it also applies to the stuff we get off the cell phones, it applies to a lot of different places. We have massive amounts of data, most of which is overwhelmingly boring, right? <laughs> that you don't really care about. So we built, um, we built an application to do what we call semantic sensing, where it's a, it's a multi-layer app where, where the meaning of the information determines what information is actually reported. So most of the boring stuff is left out, and we've got a self-organizing distributed ontology that actually runs in finite state automata, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Never mind that part. But, um, but we made it open source. We published the code because that whole issue of collecting massive amounts of data that we can't make any sense of needs, needs multiple approaches to, become, to get handleable, right? You guys are building a database, you're building clean data, which is really cool, which is great. But a lot of the data, the geospatial data, for example, is not clean data in the sense of this is a coherent, we know, what, we know why we're interested in this, right? And so that notion of why are we interested and how about if we just look at the stuff that's interesting and skip the stuff that's boring? So we open sourced that code so anybody who wants to use it can use it. Fantastic. I think we've got a highly credentialed group here. <laughs> no, um, it was just luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think at this point I'll, um, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Bethany for closing remarks. So I really want to thank our panelists for joining us tonight. I want to thank everybody in the audience for coming. Um, those of you um, at our satellite chapter viewing parties at UC Irvine, UC Davis, Michigan State University, our friends um, viewing at the Monterey Institute, we really appreciate you joining us this evening. We want to continue to engage with you on these topics. So if you're interested, please contact us. You can visit our website npwg.berkeley.edu. Thank you.